Okay. Good evening, everybody. All right, let's try that again. Good evening, everybody. All right, yes, we took a little time, but the crowd is filled. We appreciate it. Uh, my name is Ben Dworkin. I am the director of the Rebovich Institute for New Jersey Politics. And on behalf of Ryder University and the Rebovich Institute, I want to welcome you to our program, An Evening with Steve Schmidt. Tonight's program would not be possible without the generosity and assistance of the New Jersey, uh, of New Jersey United for Marriage, a coalition of groups advocating for this cause, and especially Udi Ofer, who is here tonight, the executive director of New Jersey's ACLU office. We can just give him a round of applause. Stand up. Uh, I do want to recognize that we have at least one uh, elected official uh, with us uh, tonight, councilwoman and soon to be mayor of Lawrence Township, Kathleen Lewis. Where are you? Hey! Thank you. Please. Please note that tonight's event is being recorded and everything is on the record. The format for this evening will be as follows. I will introduce Mr. Schmidt, who will come up here to speak. At the conclusion of his remarks, he and I will shift over to the platform over there, where I will conduct a uh, about a 30-minute interview talking about topics uh, similar to marriage equality and larger civil rights issues uh, in that area. If you want to know, I say this, okay, that was weird, but if you want to, uh, I say this that the topic tonight is going to be all about marriage equality uh, and focused on that. So therefore, if you really want to know what Steve feels about Woody Harrelson playing him, you have to ask that yourself. That's not going to come from us. Let me say that in the annals of American campaigning, Steve Schmidt is not only going to go down as one of the most talented political operatives there ever was, but as one of the most principled advocates for his party. In a business that is all too often filled with sycophantic babble, excessive fawning, a refusal to ever leave one's own echo chamber of analysis, our speaker tonight has distinguished himself. He goes on MSNBC to explain the Republican point of view to people who almost never hear it. And then he speaks openly and frankly to the GOP about the need for change. In today's political climate, this is what we should be calling courage. Mr. Schmidt's remarks tonight are entitled, Marriage Equality, the GOP, and the Future of America. And the issue of same-sex marriage is indeed a debate that the entire nation is having. It is worth noting, especially for these students here tonight, national attitudes on same-sex marriage have been changing dramatically, rapidly, and it has happened within your lifetimes. This is historic change. Less than a decade ago, less than 10 years ago, we saw the Republican candidate for president sweep to victory in part because of anti-same-sex marriage ballot initiatives placed around the country. We can only wonder if such a strategy would even work today. That, the fact that we even consider that, I think is an indication that things are changing. So in preparing these remarks tonight, I am just struck by one particular item. You have a program, you know his uh, biography, but let me say the key point is that he's from New Jersey. And we, hey. <laughs> born in North Plainfield, about an hour north of here, we are welcome, we are so proud to welcome him home. As we often teach here in the Rebovich Institute, if you can make it in New Jersey politics, you can make it anywhere. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, please give a warm Ryder University welcome to our special guest, a man of courage who has changed history, Steve Schmidt. Thanks a lot. Really Thank appreciate. you. Some loose wires here, let me. Well, it's a real pleasure to be uh, here with you this evening. Uh, thank you very much uh, for having me. It's always uh, a happy day for me to be back in New Jersey, uh, where I grew up. I, um, I live now, I live out west. I live uh, out on the Nevada side of Lake Tahoe, where um, the pace of life is a little bit slower. 
and uh, I still haven't gotten the New Jersey completely out of me. So on any given day, maybe waiting in a line, having some transaction, and it takes a little bit longer than it ought to, and I'll start to fidget and twitch, and, and my foot will start to tap, and my wife will remind me, she says, the New Jersey's about to come out. <laughs> Stop it. Bring, it, bring it down a little bit. Um, now, now, while I'm from New Jersey, my, um, my, my children are not. Uh, they were born on the West Coast, and uh, my daughter uh, is 10 years old now. And, um, and so I'll say things to her like, um, can you please go let the dog out? And she'll say, Daddy, that word's not pronounced like that. And I said, pronounced like what? And I said, I said dog. And she said, but, but, but we, she said, if I was to spell that, you just said D-A-W-G. Um, and, and so it's nice to be around people as I've gone around the room <laughs> who speak English with the uh, proper dialect tonight. And uh, so it's, it's great to be back in, in New Jersey. And, um, and before I begin the remarks, we talk about the rapid pace of change around this issue of marriage equality. Even since most of you have sat down this evening, there's been another step forward uh, in this important civil rights struggle as the state of Hawaii has now joined, or will join tomorrow morning, the, the states where every American has that fundamental right uh, to marry the person uh, that, they, that they love. And of course, when I first agreed to um, you know, come, and when I was asked by my colleagues at the ACLU to, to come and talk about marriage equality, this was a contested issue in New Jersey. And of course, now New Jersey is another state um, that is uh, moving forward where um, you know, every person in this state can also uh, marry the person uh, that they love. Um, and this is a fundamental issue. Right? Uh, we hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal and are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights, among them right to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. And that is our American creed. That is the charter. That is the place from where everything else comes. Our Constitution, our notions that will make us unique as a country, the only country in the history of the world where the power of the government is derived from the people. We haven't always lived up to those words, to that charter in the history of this country. But what makes our country great is the progress to meeting that ideal. And now we are in the middle of another great civil rights struggle where we embrace every person, every man, every woman, every one of our fellow Americans, and we include them in that franchise and that ability to go and pursue happiness. And for everybody in this room uh, who is married, um, and has enjoyed the fruits of a marriage and the fulfillment that can come from, from marriage. Uh, to me, it is just a fundamental issue of right and wrong and one where we would never want to see Americans disenfranchised from the ability to have a relationship recognized, sanctioned by the state, that can bring such completeness and joy to any life. The Republican Party is an institution that is conceived in the idea of freedom. It is one of the great institutions in the history of our country, and it has served this country very, very well over its history, both of the country and the party. And you go back to its founding, has stood always for the notions of individual freedom, has stood for the dignity of the individual, the dignity of the human being. And so when we look at this issue of marriage equality, I support it, not in spite of my conservatism, but because of it. The state should not be in the business of standing between two people who love each other and want to make a lifetime commitment. That's not the role of a party that holds itself as the limited government party. 
when you look at the Republican Party today on this issue, and you look at society as a whole, marriage is a stabilizing force in American culture and American society. As a conservative, I want to see more people married, not less. And if some of those people getting married happen to be gay men or lesbians or a woman wants to marry a woman, a man wants to marry a woman, we, uh, excuse me, a man wants to marry a woman, a man wants to marry a man, a woman, a woman in today's day and age, uh, so long as there are the protections which protect religious liberty, this is none of the business of the, of the government. This is a relationship between two individuals. And part of the problem that the Republican Party has had is when we make criticisms of, criticisms of the Democratic Party as the big government party, well, the truth is we're also the big government party, except our notion of big government, including to being unprincipled against our ideals of spending, and we'll talk about that a little bit later, um, is our notions of big government conservatism are peeking in the window, talking about issues like birth control, um, being in the, in the middle of people's love lives, in the middle of people's personal behavior. And so more and more, I think you will see a progression of support inside the Republican Party around this, around this issue of, of marriage equality. At the beginning of the year, uh, there were no United States senators in the Republican Party uh, who supported marriage equality. Now there are three. Uh, Rob Portman, uh, Mark Kirk of Illinois, whose campaign I did in 2010, and Lisa Murkowski in Alaska. And the last of those three, it was interesting, was, was Rob Portman, who was one of the uh, finalists under consideration to be the vice presidential nominee in 2012, a absolutely principled conservative. But what was most important when Rob Portman came out in support of marriage equality is the fact that it wasn't greeted with outrage. It wasn't greeted with attacks. It wasn't greeted with people rushing to file papers to challenge Rob Portman. It was greeted with a collective yawn. The truth of the matter is this. If you go to Washington, overwhelmingly, the staff which is under 40 years old, typically, for most members of Congress, or most members of the United States Senate, they all support marriage equality. They're not outraged about it. They're very consistent with what we see all over the country, which is the generational divide on this issue. People under 40, whether they're Republicans, whether they're Democrats, generally supportive of the right of people to marry whomever they want to marry. And when you look at a political issue, um, and you look at the transition that occurs as people transit on the journey from being against something to being for something, it looks something like this. Politicians as a species uh, have a highly tuned instinct for self-preservation. <laughs> and they typically act in their political self-interest. So 10 years ago, when I was part of that Bush campaign in 2004, and a lot of us on that campaign at that time were really uncomfortable with the rhetoric being used around this issue of marriage equality. And a lot of us who worked on that campaign at the time were able to dissociate from it. We were able to make intellectual accommodations in our mind. We were able to subordinate that issue against other issues, security issues at that time in that race against John Kerry, you know, that we were able to convince ourselves, you know, had a, had a preeminence. Uh, but we were all uncomfortable, or many of us were uncomfortable with the issue over the course of the campaign, but it was objectively true uh, that there was a material political benefit as a Republican politician to going out there into saying, I believe marriage should be between a man and a woman, and my opponent is soft on this issue. And it worked politically. Um, that rhetoric got you votes. 
that rhetoric to find your opponent in a way, in most places, that costs them votes. Now, you have a lot of members of the Republican Party in Congress um, who are not yet out publicly talking about their support of marriage equality, but they're damn sure not out there talking about proactively marriage should be between a man and a woman, you know, and using this as a wedge issue to get votes. Because Republicans talking about this issue today, to answer the question posed as I was introduced, understand that this is an issue just as likely to cut the other way. That now it will be viewed through a prism of intolerance. That now it is an issue that will alienate important constituencies that you need to win an election. That it will hurt you among single women. It will hurt you among married women. And so many Republicans today have moved to a middle place. This is an issue you just don't want to talk about. And if you go to focus groups and you see Republicans in the focus groups and you look at Republican men, for example, over 60 years of age, you know, more than anything else, they want to get out of having the conversation about the issue. You're just uncomfortable with it. When you look at Republican politicians on the issue of marriage equality increasingly, what you see is them wanting to get out of the dialogue, getting out of the, getting out of the, getting out of the issue. And so on the journey of going from support, uh, going from opposing something to supporting something, uh, that middle ground is I just want to stop talking about it. And as soon as people figure out, and they will, because the demographics of this issue are, are very clear, um, the bad news is, as I, as I look around the, the room, you know, for people in the room who are in their 60s and 70s um, you know, who oppose marriage equality, and you look at the actuarial tables and you combine that with the poll numbers of a generation that overwhelmingly bipartisan-wise supports this issue, it's only a matter of time um, till every person in the country is able to marry the, the person they want because there's a generational shift on the issue. And you will soon see, I believe, it won't be in the 2016 election, but it may be in the 2020 election where you will see Republican candidates for president going out and supporting marriage equality for every American uh, uh, unafraid of the political consequences um, and unhindered in their ability to go out and advocate for the issue through the prism of their, you know, own ambition and, and their own, uh, own self-interest. And so even in the most conservative reaches of the country, um, even in the places where the southern evangelical religious tradition is the strongest, those demographic changes are occurring with regard to this issue. Even when you look at very religious evangelicals under 40 years of age or evangelicals in college, they support in a near majority status the notion of marriage equality. So the, so the march for, for full equality for gay men and women in this country um, is moving down the track and it's moving very, very rapidly. This is the fastest progression of any civil rights movement in the history of the, of the country. And uh, this is an issue where you will see over time more and more Republicans coming out in support of it. When I gave a talk a few years back making you know, what I called the conservative case for, for gay marriage, there were very, very few people active in the Republican Party who went out and talked about this issue on the record. A couple of years later, when the Supreme Court decision came down, there were hundreds of conservatives and Republicans that signed an amicus friend of the court brief on the, on the side of marriage equality. And so this, this progression is, is going to be very clear. And as we look ahead now to the state of Illinois, which I suspect will be the, be the next state to take this step forward where everybody will have the, the fundamental right to marry the person that they love. You will see, um, you will see this progression continue um, until uh, you know, every state 
uh, is joined together and every person in the country has the, has the same franchise. And this is fundamental to the Republican Party's ability to compete as a national party, and that will, as much as anything else, drive this issue forward. When you look at this last election cycle, one of the issues that is most worrisome if you are a Republican is the collapse of support among Hispanic voters, the fastest growing demographic in the country, uh, for Republican candidates. You know, the number was in the high 20s when George W. Bush ran uh, for re-election in 2004, received over 40 percent of the Hispanic vote. What wasn't much talked about, though, when you looked at the exit polls from this election was the fact that as badly as we did among Hispanic voters, we did even worse among Asian voters. Now, I understand why Hispanic voters would be upset with the Republican Party. Um, you know, it seems to me our deliberate strategy to antagonize the fastest growing group in the country has worked perfectly um, over, over the last couple of years. But we really haven't done too many bad things to Asians. So, so why are they rejecting the Republican Party at the level that they're rejecting the Republican Party? And they're pretty simple if you think about it. If you're a first or second generation Asian immigrant and you hear the ugly rhetoric on talk radio or out of some of our elected leaders like Steve King in Iowa, for example, or some of the extreme voices associated with the party, People put two and two together and they say, well, they must not like us very much either. And before you can convince somebody to vote for you, the most basic thing you have to do is let them know that you both like them and respect them. So when you look at this issue um, of gay marriage and you look at the Republican Party's need to do outreach into a number of communities where we're not, where we're not doing particularly, where we're not doing particularly well. Gay men, economically, should be a natural constituency for the party that prides itself on being a responsible fiscal steward uh, of the taxpayer dollar. That is uh, a party that prides itself on being the one that offers pro-growth economic policies. But you don't get to make that logical policy case if that group views you as holding them in disdain. But most importantly, outside of the inability, for example, to communicate effectively with gay men or, or lesbians, is the fact that when you go out and you are disrespectful to an entire community, you alienate other parts of the electorate that you need to do well with in order to win. So when you go out as a Republican politician and you try to make the case by attacking any one group, you wind up alienating at a fundamental level, married women, single women. And that in part drives the gender gap. And when you look at um, the Republican Party and demographically where we're doing well, um, it matches up quite nicely with the demographics of talk radio. We do well, increasingly, with white, old men living in rural areas. There's not enough of them anymore. In 1988, George Herbert Walker Bush got 59% of the white vote. And as a result, he got over 400 electoral votes. Getting 59% of the white vote is no easy feat in a presidential campaign. Mitt Romney did it, and he got blown out. So what happened? Well, what happened is the country's changed. Uh, and it's changed demographically and in a direction
that it's not going to change back. The electorate in 2012 was 2% less white than it was in 2008. The electorate in 2016 will be 2% less white than it was in 2012. And so fundamentally, there are two types of political parties, just like there are two types of churches. There's the type of church that goes out and seeks converts, trying to bring people in. And there's the type of church that goes out and hunts heretics, trying to kick people out. Now, part of the reason that I went into politics in the first place is because my math level on a good day is about a third grade level. <laughs> but even with my limited math skills, can understand very clearly that in order to make policy and advance a conservative agenda, it requires you to get more votes than the other candidate. And in a two-party system, that roughly translates to the ability to get 50 plus one. When you're in the business of excluding people from the party, kicking people out, imposing purity tests in the party, what you wind up with is a contracting political party. And political parties exist in one of two states. They're either expanding, otherwise known as the Democratic Party, or they're contracting, otherwise known as the Republican Party. We had a vibrant tradition in the Northeast of, of moderate, pragmatic, uh, fiscally responsible, reform-minded governance for a long time in this country. And I would argue that the Republican Party was a stronger institution when the Christy Whitmans of the world and the John Lindsay's and the Tom Kane's weren't just welcomed in it, but were powerful and important members of the coalition that made it the majority party and led it to winning presidential election after presidential election. The Republican Party today, if you look at just the states that the Democrats have won six of the last six elections, they stand at 242 electoral votes. That doesn't count Florida, that doesn't count Virginia, that doesn't count North Carolina, New Mexico, Colorado, any one of the other states that have trended in the direction of the Democratic Party where Democrats have won in recent years. When you're starting with a six out of six base at 242 electoral votes, and you start off at the beginning of a campaign as a Republican having to write off California and write off New York, uh, they're as remote a chance of getting there as there is of taking off out of Newark Airport in a 737 and flying to Mars. Not going to happen, right? Very difficult to win a national election. So let's look at Dementism. Everybody's familiar with Jim Dement, the former senator from South Carolina. And what Jim Dement says, what he aspires to, is a pure party. A pure party, of course, defined by agreement with Jim DeMint. And what Jim DeMint has said is that I'd rather have 33 people in the United States Senate agreeing with me 100% of the time, right, than to have a majority of people who disagree with me some of the time. Are there actually any Republicans in the room? I didn't meet any going around the room. We got a couple. All right, great. Ronald Reagan understood this and understand this. Dementism is the opposite of Reaganism. Ronald Reagan said, someone who agrees with me 80% of the time is not my political enemy. They're not my political opponent. They're my political ally. And so this notion that we define conservatism today on the grounds of fidelity to the most outrageous statements made by a talk radio host, or by fidelity to what Jim DeMint believes, I'd like to argue that that's fundamentally unconservative. I'm a conservative in part because I don't want anybody telling me what to think. We're a political philosophy advanced by the, part, by the Republican Party 
that's fundamentally about the empowerment of the, of the individual. And so a political party rooted in conservatism, which is a pragmatic philosophy, and this was William F. Buckley's point, is that conservatism to be an effective political philosophy, to be an effective governing philosophy, has to be rooted in reality. And so when we look at the state of the Republican Party today and, and all of its difficulties, let's look at the influence, for example, of the conservative entertainment complex. Well, let me assure you that whether Barack Obama's president or Hillary Clinton's president, the interest of the guys on the radio isn't winning elections. It's not building a majority. It's putting money in the pocket from advertisers, right? When you drive the message like they drive the message and your elected political class is subordinate and afraid of them, you wind up where we are today with a serious governing philosophy brought low because what it has become is not a answer to the country's problems. It has become, to a large degree, a cult of personality where we define who is and who is not a conservative on the basis of tactics. You know, Joe Scarborough said this this morning um, on, 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 on his show, and he couldn't be right. If it's fourth and 31, and you don't run the ball up the middle, it doesn't mean you're not tough. It means you're smart, because that play is probably not going to work. And so when we look at the Republican Party today, and we look at the demographic trends cutting it, cutting against it, um, and we consider it in the context of this issue of marriage equality, um, you, will, I, you will see over, over, this, you know, over this next period of time as we move into the 2016 election, a great debate began to take place between two wings of the Republican Party. And part of the consequence of the dysfunction of the party today will be a rebirth of serious policy coming out of the Republican Party. And I think a rebirth of the notions of the relationship between the government and, it, and the people, uh, between the government and its role in society. And when you look at the demographic trends and you look at the Republican Party and what it will need to do to become a majority party again, you will see more and more members of Congress and more and more United States senators and more and more governors who begin to embrace uh, not just marriage equality, uh, but reach out effectively to all manner of communities where the party as a whole is not doing very well. And that brings me real quickly to Chris Christie. So you have, for the first time in a long time, a governor in a state that is clearly a democratic state, not only winning overwhelmingly, um, but, but, but campaigning and performing effectively in all manner of diverse communities, whether it be women, single and married, Hispanics, uh, uh, African Americans. And so there is a, there is a uh, template there uh, for success because Chris Christie, as much as anything, stands for the expanding model of the Republican Party, not the contracting model of the Republican Party. Um, and you will see over the next couple of years a big debate also take place, not just along an ideological line, but along the lines between the gubernatorial wing of the party uh, and, the, uh, and, the, and the congressional wing of the party. Now, the congressional wing of the party, um, in the history, the history of modern polling, is at the lowest recorded levels ever, ever. That was the net effect of the government shutdown. 
That was the net effect of the Russian roulette with the, company, with the country's full faith and credit, that we would flirt with a possible default. Fundamentally unconservative. It's radical. It's not conservative. The gubernatorial wing of the party is succeeding all over the country where you can look at a red state, blue state economic model and nearly every comparison, it comes out really well on the red state side. So when we look at these issues, you know, whether it be gay marriage, whether it be immigration reform, these issues are preventing the Republican Party from reaching out effectively on its strengths. Uh, preventing the Republican Party from reaching out uh, with regard to its uh, uh, fiscal agenda, an economic, an economic growth agenda. And it's important, I think, for the country, as a conservative, that we have a change of direction from the trajectory, from the trajectory that, we're, that we're headed on. Um, last thing um, before we get into, get into questions, uh, from a Republican perspective. As bad as things are for the Republican Party, um, as dysfunctional as the party has been, uh, the Democratic Party is also in tough shape. One of, the, one, of the, one of the constructs that comes out of Washington is this notion that everything's a zero-sum game. That uh, if the Republicans are doing worse, than the Democrats, then fundamentally what that means is the Democrats are winning. Well, the reality is you look at the government shutdown and you look at this debt default debate, it brought everybody's numbers low. One of the defining issues of our time is the complete collapse of trust in very nearly every institution in the country with the exception of the, of the U.S. military. And the president's numbers have been dragged into the 30s and the generic congressional numbers for Democrats have been dragged uh, to near record lows. Also, they're only good in comparison to the congressional Republican number, but what unites everybody in the country, no matter where you live, no matter what party you're in, uh, so long as you're not living inside the Beltway, is a total disdain for Washington, D.C. by those of us who live outside of that, by those of us who live outside of that city. And so we see this debacle unfolding with regard to the Affordable Care Act or Obamacare. And I think that President Obama's promise that if you like your insurance, you can keep it, will go down as perhaps the biggest, but certainly among the biggest, broken political promises in the history of the country. And it's interesting to watch as this begins to unfold uh, because if you were to listen to the Democrats, you know, what they'll say is, hey, this is a website glitch. We'll fix the website, everything's going to be better. And I think what this fundamentally is is the early stages of a collapse of a program that sought to take over one-sixth of the economy of the United States through a legislative vehicle and a bill that nobody read and nobody understood. As Nancy Pelosi famously said, well, we have to pass it in order to understand what's in it. Well, now we understand what's in it. And understand this also, that the employer mandate aspect of this, which was delayed a year, um, wait until people who are employed with employer-based health care also find out that they've been kicked off of their kicked off of their insurance as well. So the federal government's intrusion uh, into this aspect, uh, personal aspect of people's lives, pre presents an enormous political opportunity for the Republican Party, an enormous ability for Republicans to go out there and to offer solutions around a real problem. And we'll talk a little bit about health care, as, as I'm sure tonight as we, as we go into this, is such a dominant issue. But one of the problems was, uh, when you look at health care, is you had 
40 million people in the country uninsured, and uninsured is different than having access to health care. Uh, the problem was is those uninsured people, when they accessed health care, were accessing the most expensive health care in the history of the world since the, beginning of, since the beginning of time, and it was having profound fiscal impact on the, on the country. But the solution was a 100 percent solution affecting everybody for what was at the end of the day a 15 percent problem you know, for, the, for the country. And one of the things, when you look at liberalism in today's day and age, and my criticism of it would be this, there's a fundamental inability to distinguish between intentions and results. One of the problems we have in American politics is our constant questioning of the other side's intentions. So, when I was on television this morning, a person I like very much, you know, did just that uh, you know, at a personal level. And she talked about the fact that, well, Republicans, you know, they want to end public education and they want to do this to the old people. And I wanted to jump up and say, yes, and next we will come for your pets. <laughs> the issue with Obamacare is not that it was badly intentioned. I think the president had great intentions. I think he saw a problem and he wanted to have a solution for it. The issue is it doesn't work. When you look at the Veterans Administration and you look at the fact that you, know, you have an average wait time of 360 days to get an answer on benefits across the depth and breadth of the federal government, you see a failure to be able to execute, a failure to meet the efficiency of the private sector. And it's in that space where the Republican Party, in my view, can rejuvenate itself as a party that has serious solutions to the biggest problems facing our country today, as an entrepreneurial party that is able to go out there and talk about reforming these top-down sclerotic institutions that were formed in the middle of the last century and are not functioning anywhere near like they need to function in the second decade of the 21st century. So a reform party based on its conservative heritage that is able to be consistent with its charter, which is respect for the dignity of the individual, respect for every American, the ability to go into every community, black communities, Latino communities, and yes, the gay community, and to say, this is what we stand for, this is what we believe in, and we invite everybody to join in with us under this umbrella of ideas. That's how the Republican Party becomes a national party again. And if we don't go down that path, we will be a regional political party that carries the old confederacy and we will be consigned to permanent minority status in this, in this country. Last word, and I'll say this because I ran Arnold Schwarzenegger's campaign in 2006. California was Ronald Reagan's home state. California was a state that Republicans carried that had a great conservative tradition. California is a state that the Republicans are in such low esteem in the eyes of the voters that soon, within 10 years' time, it will be the third party in California behind the independent or decline to state party. Um, there is a old saying that a lot of things uh, start in California. California is a trendsetter for the country. And sometimes those trends can be for the good, and sometimes those trends can be for the bad. Uh, we ought to look very clearly uh, at the result 20 years on about what happened to the Republican Party in California when it mortgaged its future in a short-term transaction, putting Latinos on TV, running across the border with the message of they're coming, they're coming, they're coming to take your jobs destroyed the Republican Party in the state of California. 
And so when we look in the Washington Republican Party and we consider Dominism as a governing or a political strategy, and we look at Ted Cruz, and we look at the rhetoric that comes from that wing of the party and from the talk radio universe, um, Republicans ought to understand the consequences of it over the long term, and they're not good. What I think will happen, because I'm optimistic both about the future of the country and the future of the party, is you will see whether it is on marriage equality or a range of other issues, I think the party become more inclusive and again embrace those big tent principles that made it a uh, national party and one that was the dominant presidential party for much of the 20th century. Um, talk too long, uh, but thank you for listening. I appreciate it. and. Um, and uh, look forward to answering questions. Thank you very much. <laughs> okay, we're going to shift over here. <laughs> I am. Um, I am given the privilege of asking questions on behalf of the audience, though I'm sure there are countless ones that everybody else wants to ask. Let me try and hit a few uh, here. And, and sticking with this topic, I, I just want to ask you personally, Steve, have you gotten any blowback because you're the Republican on MSNBC, you're the guy who makes criticisms of the party, there was a whole movie about watching you fight with Sarah Palin, there, I mean, do you get, uh, in your professional life, is there any blowback uh, because of taking these kinds of stands, critiquing the future of the party? Well, you know, I, um, no. Um, you know, the direct answer is, you know, in fact, um, you know, whether it's on marriage equality or a number of issues, you know, lots of people, a lot of people who work, you know, for members in Washington, yes, I agree with you, you know, completely, you know, the criticisms, you know, that I offer, you know, of the, of the party. You know, I think, in fact, you see more and more people starting to make as make as well, um, and and um, and I and I and I don't think I do, and would be careful not to. But you never want to be gratuitous in your in your criticism. Uh, but I but I think there's a fundamentally important uh, debate that has to take place in the Republican Party. Um, you know, I have, um, you know, I love the Republican Party. I think it's one of the greatest institutions in the cause of the advancement of human freedom in the history of civilization. Um, and uh, I want to see a healthy Republican Party. And I don't want to see the Republican Party going down the path that's being led by the Ted Cruz's of the world. I think it's a road to disaster. And uh, I want to see a rejuvenated party. And I think that we need to have this fight in the party. Let me ask you, you brought up Chris Christie. Many observers felt that our governor really tried to thread the needle uh, on the marriage equality issue. On one hand, he got to maintain his opposition uh, to the ruling, the court ruling that was going to allow it. He could still go out in a presidential campaign and yell about the liberal courts who did it, uh, which might get some, uh, some good response. On the other hand, He's the guy who pulled back and wasn't going to fight it and therefore gets a lot of credit for the people who wanted to see this decision inevitably. Uh, how do you think, this is a question for you though, how do you think Christie's decision on the marriage appeal is going to affect his chances as a presidential candidate? Um, I don't think it will affect his chances at all as a presidential candidate. Um, look, I, I think, you know, I think that Chris, I think the fact that Chris Christie had to thread the needle on this shows how quickly this issue has advanced and progressed. And I do think the reality is um, it shows two things about Chris Christie. First thing it shows about Chris Christie, he's a pragmatist. And I think Chris Christie looked at the situation and he understood that he was moving pretty quickly down the tracks towards a veto override um, by, you know, with carrying a number of Republican votes and that he would have rather faced the, the court decision than the veto override but when you had that 7-0 decision, you know, and, and by a judge that he had appointed, uh, you know, what it showed is pragmatism. And, you know, pragmatism, 
uh, along with incrementalism, in my view, is not a bad thing. I think it's a virtue in politics. And so uh, when you look ahead, you know, to these states, you know, I always say, you know, the press tends to cover Republican primaries like sociologists covering a primitive tribe they've discovered <laughs> in the deep Amazon, you know, in the 1930s, and they're observing the dance, right, the, the native dance, trying to interpret what it means. And so, you know, the press always covers Republican primaries through the prism of, you know, well, it's the craziest guy who wins, right? You know, there's no chance, you know, that this person could possibly be the nominee. You know, it's the crazy person's going to win, right? Um, you know, in fact, you know, what drives the ballot in the Republican presidential primaries always is electability. Delusional, though the South Carolina voter may have been by voting <laughs> for Newt Gingrich. Um, the reason that Newt Gingrich surged to the top of the ballot and won the South Carolina is because underneath in the polls, the numbers, his electability number went to number one. And that was the point of the campaign, you know, when Gingrich was going around saying, you know, only I, Newt, can possibly debate Barack Obama effectively on the stage. I'm going to follow him all around on Air Force One. People said, I agree. Look how good Newt is in the debates, right? You know, that's going to work. He was viewed as the most electable candidate for that brief shining moment of time. He wins the primary. Um, I don't believe, um, though I could be wrong, um, and there is a possibility that I am. And that possibility, um, to me, is a frightening one. Uh, but, you know, I think that we will nominate the most electable conservative. Um, I don't think we're going to have a process that results in a Cuccinelli, you know, at a national mm -hmm. level. But if we do, um, we will uh, learn the hard way. And we will, you know, lose another presidential election. And, you know, then the reform you know, effort will probably, you know, begin to take place after that. So let me just stick with the Christie theme for a second. Obviously, there are going to be people who are going to attack him, uh, even if they might not be the ones historically who would, the electable ones who would win. But there are going to be people in real uh, opponents of his who are going to attack him. What strategic advice do you give presidential candidate Chris Christie on how to handle the attacks on issues like how he dealt with the gay marriage issue? Well, first off, you, you, in a, the structure of a presidential campaign is such is that you can't allow yourself to be trapped in debates around things you did yesterday. You have to offer a vision of the things you're going to do tomorrow for the country. So if the campaign is fundamentally an exercise of uh, talking about what you did in New Jersey. Um, you know, the truth is, if you live in New Hampshire or Iowa or any of these other states, you know, what you want to hear is that you know, this guy was successful in New Jersey. You don't necessarily want to hear the New Jersey story because you live in New Hampshire. It has, limited, it has, it has very limited relevance. So all elections, you know, at the end of the day, are about the future, not the past, number one. Number two, um, and politicians, um, and Chris Christie, I think, needs to be cognizant of this, is, you know, elections are about the people who vote in them, not about the politicians who run in them. So a campaign that's entirely self-referential about someone's accomplishments detached from the lives of the people who are voting in them is, is, not, going to be, is, not, going to be a, is not going to be a successful one. You know, the Republican Party, you know, from a policy perspective, uh, you know, it's like watching a rerun of the 1980s. We have, a, we have an absolute deficit of innovative policy ideas to deal with the problems that the country is facing. Part of the reason that Ronald Reagan was such an iconic and successful president is that he had policies that were relevant to the time that he lived in and offered solutions to the problems of that time. And I don't think the Republican Party on a whole range of issues can necessarily say that today. So you look, you know, Chris Christie, you know, is going to have to have a very robust policy agenda. And last point on this. We have gotten into a habit in the Republican Party of telling, not showing. And in a presidential campaign, you need to show, not tell. And here's what I mean by that. 
you don't go around convincing people you're a conservative by repeating as loudly as you can, I'm a conservative, conservative, conservative. Because what you wind up doing is what Mitt Romney did. He goes to a speech in Washington and announces that I govern Massachusetts as a severely conservative governor. And one commentator said after he said that, that he's like a guy who just took a Berlitz course in how to talk to actual conservatives. <laughs> and when you go and you say strange things like I was a severely conservative governor, it's proof positive that you're no such thing. And so the way that you convince people that you are a conservative is to have one governed like one, not act like you just caught, got caught with your hand in the cookie char jar when the, when the issue comes up, too. And, and lastly, to have actual policies that you're advocating that are, in fact, uh, conservative. And if you do those things, I think it takes the, I think it takes the edge off. One of the uh, things, I mean, you've moved into the private sector. You work for Edelman Worldwide. Uh, so you study, and in your position, you look at how public opinion is being formed on a whole host of things, not just uh, politics. So on, on this issue on gay marriage, what, what do you think, why do you think it's shifted so quickly? Uh, what is, is it things like we had the Tyler Clemente case up, uh, you know, up the road here. We've had uh, public figures who have popular uh, personalities who have come out. Are people just easier to come out? And so you end up with everyone's got a son or somebody they know who's finally admitting yeah. it. What do you think is changed? Well, right, the term is in the closet. Right? And we talk about coming out, right? What does coming out mean? It means revealing yourself, right? Stepping out of the shadows, stepping out of that, stepping out of that closet. So there was a mayor of a town in Israel today, and he asserted publicly, I don't know if any of you saw this, but he asserted there's no gay people who live in my town. Um, and you know, Iran, you know, um Akhtaminajad, mm -hmm. a couple of years ago in an interview, he asserted there's no gay people in the entirety of Iran. Um, they don't they don't they don't exist there. Um, and so the reality was, um, you know, I think culturally, I think a generation ago, uh, you might have known a gay person, you might have suspected that someone was gay, um, but people were in the closet. And then we have this great tragedy that begins to unfold in the 1980s with the AIDS crisis. And all of a sudden, you have an entire generation um, that is dying. And those people were brothers, and they were sisters, uh, and they were husbands, and they were wives, and they were friends. And all of a sudden, uh, people, um, whether they wanted to or not, are out of the closet by, by force of their illness. And then, as a result of this great tragedy, I think inside of the gay community, you saw more and more people have the courage to say that we're not going to live our lives in the, in the shadows. We're not going to live our lives in the closet. We're going to be who we are. And in my case, um, you know, I have a gay sister. And um, that had a profound impact, you know, for me on, on my views on this issue. It went from, you know, something that was remote um, something that, um, you know, was about other people. And the truth is, you know, my sister was the same person, you know, the day before I knew she was gay as she was the day after she was gay. And I loved her just as much. And I think you repeat that cycle millions and millions and millions of times around the country. And then you see that added on top of it. You see, you know, the culture. You know, we live in a modern family world. We live, you know, in a world, you know, of will and grace. You know, and all of a sudden, um, gay people, uh, by becoming accessible, um, you know, we, you know, discovered, I think, in the straight community, you know, that sometimes these were people in our families and we love them very much. Um, and other times they were people that we worked with or they were friends, but they were good people. Um, and these were people of strong character. And then over time, I think it becomes the case that maybe it's the people who demonize them. And maybe it's the people who seek to make themselves look big at their expense. Maybe they're the people 
of low character. And so I think that as we give consideration to this issue, consistent with the American creed I talked about it at the beginning, I, I, I think that on the side of decency and on the side of equality and fairness in, in the march forward on all of these issues that has always been the story of our country, we've seen such a rapid evolution accelerated in the middle of this era where we're in such profound change with regard to how we communicate. And I think the social media revolution we're in is as profound as the transition from telegraph to radio and radio to TV and TV to you know, satellite instantaneous communication to now where everybody's their own broadcast platform. And I think all of those things together over a 30-year arc have brought us to where we are today. And I think that trend line will do nothing but accelerate. Let me pick up on that, because one of the things you talked about in your remarks was that there's a certain inevitability, as with the changing demographics uh, that you talked about, on this specific issue. At the same time, you talked about the Republican Party having this fight on its hand, that it's, it's not like everybody is accepting this view of any kind of inevitability, and there's certainly those who would say in the last 10 years the Republican Party has become more conservative as we've come to know the Tea Party and these uh, folks, the Dementism, as you, as you talked about. What has to happen? I mean, we know there's going to be a fight, but what has to happen for one side to win? Look, you know, if you, if you look at, you know, redistricting and gerrymandering, um, you know, Rahm Emanuel, um, you know, made this point on a panel that I was on, that he spoke on a couple weeks ago. It used to be that um, voters pick the politicians. We've, we've become so sophisticated in the redistricting process that now politicians pick the voters. And that leaves, as a result, a system where the politician is insulated at a macro level from public opinion, right? So, you know, how is it, um, that you wind up with a Christine O'Donnell, for example, as your U.S. Mm -hmm. Senate nominee in Delaware. Uh, you wind up with her as the nominee because you have 12% turnout in the Republican primary, and Mike Castle, a you know moderate, you know certainly if you know you know. And by the way, the one issue that unites the entirety of the Republican Party, you know, from its most conservative member to its most liberal member. Um, you know, it's not abortion, you know, it's not gay marriage, it's none of these issues. It was Obamacare. Right? Mike Castle would have been a vote against it. Um, you know, of course, you know, Christine O'Donnell surrendered the seat. You know, Mitch McConnell made the point that the Senate Conservative Fund has elected more Democrats in the last two <laughs> election cycles than the Democrat Senate Campaign Committee has elected. Uh, and he couldn't, he couldn't be more right about that. So, you know, on all of these issues in these congressional districts, we have a political class in both parties that's just totally insulated, uh, you know, from public opinion to a degree because the chances of them getting beaten in a competitive election um, by the, you know, by the other side are virtually nil. But wouldn't, I'm sorry, but wouldn't that, uh, this situation of gerrymandering that we have in terms of our congressional districts, wouldn't that prevent the inevitability of gay it, marriage it, it, coming It, it would if the issue of marriage equality was going to be decided in the Congress, and it's not. The issue of marriage equality is going to be decided mm -hmm. in the states. You know, they're, they're, the game is no longer being played in the, you know, in the Congress. You know, and at the end of the day, you know, this will be a fait accompli. If you look at don't ask, don't tell, um, and no doubt we're going to have some Republican presidential candidates up on the stage uh, talking about pandering, saying that they're going to re repeal the repeal of Don't Ask, Don't Tell. Now, one of the criticisms that Republicans back in the day used to make of Democrats in this issue is that, you know, the U.S. military is the last institution in the country you should ever be doing sociological experiments with. That you should never apply your social agenda to the uh, institution that protects the country. Well, when you talk about repealing the repeal of don't ask, don't mm -hmm. teal, 
what, what side's playing, you know, social politics, right, social issue politics with the military. It's not the Democrats because the military is functioning quite well. Um, and without incident, you know, from the chairman of the Joint Chiefs to the sergeant in the field, uh, who generationally has no issue serving alongside, uh, you know, gay men and women. So when you look at all of these issues, you know, this is now, as we move towards, you know, the, the entirety of the country having marriage equality, this will play out in the states, and then it will ultimately wind up back in front of the courts. You know, but the role of Congress to impede or stop this is, is, is extremely, you know, is extremely, is extremely limited. So to pick up on your idea about these are battles that are being fought in, in the states, one of the things the states do is that they send delegates to the Republican National Convention. Mm -hmm. So the question then, you know, is in 2016, in 2020, is the Republican Party going to have a fight over its platform on these issues? Or is it going to be a piece of paper that the nominee will ignore and the, the hardest right wing organized folks on the party are going to be able to write a repeal of Don't Ask, Don't Tell, and, and et cetera? It will, um, it will be, well, first off, I mean, you know, the party platform will be a document that the candidates ignored in the year 2350, <laughs> right? I mean, um, in both parties. Uh, you know, what a, but isn't it a principle to, right. to fight uh, um, that, or is everyone just well, going to ignore look, it? Well, look, I think like at the end of the day, we live, in a, we live in an enormous country, 350 million people in it. Um, you know, there's a big diversity of views in both parties. You know, I'm, I'm good friends with Antonio Villaragosa, who was the chair of the Democrat National Convention and Democratic National Convention. And, um, you know, you had the omission in their platform of under God. And you had that scene in the Democratic Party where when they made the motion to put it back in, people started booing. You know, and Antonio decisively wielded the gavel down, and he said it passes, and walked <laughs> off the, you know, and walked off the stage. So look, you know, both parties at an activist level, you know, are are they out of touch to a degree with you know the mainstream you know public opinion in the country in the middle of the electorate? They are. Um, you know, when you know when you look at when you look at you know, the Virginia race, which is instructive, because you know with with Christie. You had, you know, again, you have an example of the expanding model in New Jersey. And in Virginia, you had an example of the contracting model. You know, Terry McAuliffe um, ran against, you know, I think there's 6 billion people on the planet. 350 million of them are Americans, some lesser number are Virginians. And he ran against the only person he could have conceivably beaten. Um, you know, luck of the Irish. Um, and so, so, but how did Cuccinelli become the nominee in Virginia? He became the, he became the nominee in Virginia uh, because he was picked in a, in a convention process. And so if you pick people through a convention process, um, which is a real small number of activists, you get that result. If you pick people in a more inclusive process, in the inclusive process being you know, open primaries, where you want to habituate people to voting you know, for the Republican candidate. I mean, there's a lot of data that says if you participate in one party's primary, um, you're an independent, you're even a Democrat, you know, if it's totally open, who votes in the, you know, in the primary, you're likely to stay with that candidate all the way through. So what you want to do is habituate people at the earliest points in the process to voting for the candidate on, on your side. You don't want to shut down the process to get an ideological result. When you do, in every case, it's a disaster. Let me just uh, shift. One of the things that just happened in the last week uh, was that the United States Senate passed the Employment Non-Discrimination right. Act, ENDA, as it's called. And it would uh, expand prohibitions on uh, workplace discrimination to uh, homosexuality, to sexual preference, sexual uh, orientation. It's apparently dead on arrival in the House. Yep. How, you know, are we going to see an expansion? If there's going to be, as you predict, an expansion of uh, a broader understanding, more welcoming on the gay marriage issue, what about on discrimination in terms of that would also affect this community, which conceivably is even more important than marriage, I mean, employment discrimination. How do you see this playing out? Is the House going to change? You just talked about the... It will the change. It will change. It will change over time. Um, you know, look, when you look at the House Republican brand, 
just just from a public opinion perspective as a as a brand um, you, you look at it and you say well it can't be any more toxic but alas it can <laughs> um, <laughs> I was um, not to not to digress I was um, I was I was um, I caught an episode in a hotel room not long ago of Honey Boo Boo, and um, I was I was I was um, I had not seen it before and I was transfixed by it, um, and you sit and you and you ponder deep thoughts about our culture and our <laughs> society as you watch Honey Boo Boo and can it go any lower and um, and then I was home the other day and I and I caught an episode of Paternity Court on TV and. Um, and having seen an episode of Paternity Court, in fact, it can drop down a floor <laughs> lower from, you know, from, you know, from, from Honey Boo Boo. And in the same way, um, the Republican Congress, right, that will, will, that will block ENDA in the House, um, there's certainly, in my view, a consensus, um, whether or not you're opposed to marriage equality or not, that everybody ought to be treated with respect in this country. And that people should not be able to be fired or lose their job or be in danger of losing their job because of their sexual orientation. I think there's an overwhelming bipartisan consensus around that around that question, and you see that manifest itself with the number of Republicans voting in favor of it in the United States Senate. Um, you know, part of the you know toxic dysfunction that you see in the House and. You know, one need look no further than the government shutdown and the threat over default and, you know, frankly, in my view, a radicalism uh, that, is, that is thriving in that body, um, you know, to understand where, uh, you know, the opposition to end it comes. But, you know, whether, the, but, but, but I believe very strongly um, that, that that will not hold, um, that, you know, will, will fall away you know, before very long, maybe in the next election cycle, the fever, if you will, will, will break on these issues. But, you know, the, these, these issues um, and what changes people's, you know, minds on issues politically is when they do damage. Republicans blocking that in the House uh, will do more damage to the Republican brand um, and, you know, ultimately the damage done is also how you, um, you get to a place where, where, there'll, where there'll be a change of position. Let me ask you one final uh, question. What can advocates who are fighting for marriage equality, what can they learn from this particular battle that might apply to other battles on civil rights on, and uh, on uh, parenting rights, on the ability to adopt children? Are there, are there, are there any number of uh, civil rights issues uh, that are out there, uh, judicial reform, different things like that, uh, sentencing reform. Can we learn anything from this battle on gay marriage that would help those advocates in other civil rights battles? I think, I think that the, I think, what the, I think when it comes to the issue of marriage equality, um, the success and the rapid progression is built on a foundation of accessibility to the lives of the real people who are affected by it. And, and what I mean by that is these are not remote, abstract issues that aren't relevant to the people not affected. I mean, I think at an idealistic level that is an American, I think that we are all diminished when any of us are disenfranchised from uh, fundamental rights and, and protections. Um, the lesson on all of these issues is that you have to be in the fight. You have to be courageous in articulating uh, your point of view. You have to be unafraid of advancing the agenda and you have to be unafraid of facing the people that will say, no, not now, it's too early, it's too, it's too soon. And if you lead, and in my view, you lead from a position of principle, um, and you lead, um, you know, in the, in the words, you know, of, of Dr. King, right, you know, the, the, the paraphrase, and I hate to quote that the notes, but right, uh, you know, the, what was it, 
is that the arc of history is long, but it bends towards justice. Mm -hmm. and, I, and I think that that is the progress in America. We're not going to turn back on any of these issues. We're not going to retreat from the fundamental protections, right, that people have fought for and earned. They're going to continue to advance. And, um, you know, I think that there will be an emerging political consensus. And in fact, um, it's only an emerging political sense of consensus because this generation hasn't taken their rightful seat, you know, at the head of the table yet. But when they do, there's not going to be Republicans and Democrats will still be fighting. But we won't be fighting about this issue. This will be an issue we all we all agree on. You know, we used to fight, you know, on issues like Medicare or on Social Security. Um, the truth is, you know, that it was, you know, the the president that institutionalized. The New Deal was Eisenhower, right? By not trying to roll it back, um, you know, the president that institutionalized Reaganism was Bill Clinton. With the you know era of big government is over, he didn't try to roll it back. Um, you know, he he accepted it and to a degree advanced it. Um, you know, welfare reform, you know, being a being an example there. So there's there's no when when you look at all of these issues. It, none of these, none of these movements, none of the progress achieved by them will be rolled back. What you'll see over time, and it'll be over a pretty quick period of time, you know, a, a consensus developing around issues of justice and equality and freedom by both parties, and then we'll go, you know, fight it, fight each other, you know, on the issues that have typically divided us, which is, you know, the the role of government and how big it should be and um, what is its role in, in people's lives. But it won't be around these issues. The courage and being unafraid to lead. On that note, I think we could all take something from this. Thank you, Steve Schmidt. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. That concludes our evening. Everybody, please have a safe trip home. Thank you very much. <laughs>